Well, the Republicans are having their panels. And as we wait for the people to come through of interest to so we can see where the uh, corruption was stemming from for identification purposes, CDC director was up there and he had some interesting thought processes. Uh, this one in particular, I want to look at first, which is his view on gain of function. Assume they can be mutable in a lab. Dr. Redfield, are you an advocate for a moratorium on gain of function research, particularly research on potential pandemic pathogens and why? Yes, I am. I think that, um, again, I think the people that are advocates for gain of function research do believe that by doing this research, they somehow get ahead of the curve. Um, I'm of the point of view that we don't need to make pathogens more transmissible or more pathogenic in order to get ahead of the curve. We can. So as you hear him speak, he's not a big advocate for gain of function. He understands that these people think they're doing the right thing. And his body is singing with him. He's accessing parts of his brain on the emotional part when he talks about them. It's also his thought process. So I would expect, you know, emotions wouldn't be too far from that as well. Uh, It also speaks that he's probably a very emotional guy. He's led by his emotions. It's not the worst trait. I mean, he could be a complete psychopath. That would be really bad. So an emotional person is much more redeemable, in my opinion, than a complete logical person. But he's not gating. His hands are moving freely. He's playing with something. So we got the little nervousness there, which in the context of this, you're in front of a committee investigating what all happened when the world went mad. Begin to deal with those pathogens as they evolve. I don't think this should be a decision made by scientists alone. This is a societal decision. There should be a broad debate about whether this research is really necessary. And if so, we should decide how to do it safely and responsibly. I remind people, when I was CDC director, one of the most difficult things I had to do as a 20-something year army vet was shut down Fort Detrick. So as he goes into this story, the hands are starting to get tighter as he's playing what looks like a paperclip that he's bending around. I'm going to assume Fort Dietrich was a very bad mark on his career, or at least made um, enemies in areas that still haunt him to this day. Just a long story short, so you don't have to hear it. Uh, He shut him down because their bio labs were not up to snuff. It wasn't very popular. These uh, people were my friends. I knew them. But our inspection show, And he got a little bit of a smile. His mouth, if you see him when he's just relaxed, it's like in a constant frown. It's such an upside down smile. It's very odd. I've never seen anyone in real life with this type of mouth form. So when he smiles, it's just the frown is like less. Thank you, Chairman. For two years, myself and the other Republicans on this subcommittee connected the dots We exposed the evidence supporting our strong belief that COVID was developed and leaked from the Wuhan lab. And during those same two years, the same Democrats that sit on this committee, they only hindered, they obstructed, they refused to hold hearings and get to the truth. Now we see mounting evidence supporting the COVID-19 originated from the lab in Wuhan, China, run by the Communist Chinese uh, Party. And this hearing is about getting to the truth. I thank the chairman for making this the very first hearing because the American people who have seen just as many fellow Americans die from COVID, as nearly as many die from COVID, that died in every war since the American Revolution combined, deserve to know the truth. Uh, Dr. Redfield, you pointed to the lab leak theory even before we did. In mid-January of 2020, you expressed concerns to Dr. Fauci to uh, Jeremy Farrer of UK's Wellcome Trust and to Dr. Tedros of World Health Organization that, quote, we had to take the lab leak hypothesis with extreme seriousness. And you urged Dr. Fauci to investigate both the lab and the natural hypotheses. Shortly thereafter, on February 1st, uh, Farrer convened a meeting of a group of 11 top scientists across five time zones and asked Dr. Fauci to join, and he wrote, quote, my preference is to keep this group really tight. Obviously, ask everyone to treat in total confidence, unquote. Dr. Redfield, you were excluded from this call, but up until then, you had been on every single, you were included in every other conversation. What changed? Why do you think that you were excluded from these conversations? 
Thank you very much. I think uh, just to emphasize. Uh, so he's getting into this question that you just heard, and he's gone gated, and he's brought his hands closer to his chest, so he's keeping himself tight. Uh, in, in, in early to mid-January, I did have multiple calls with Fauci, Farrar, and, and, and Tedros about how important I thought it was that science get engaged in, in aggressive, aggressively pursuing both. So you hear the flexion in his voice, science. At that point, it's telling you that he was bucking them then. Science. He's also squinting his eyes a lot. There's a deeper stress here. Hypotheses. I also expressed as a clinical virologist that I felt it was um, not scientifically plausible that this virus went from a bat to humans and became one of the most infectious viruses that we have with humans. All viruses are not the same. So when you look at coronaviruses with, for SARS and MERS, for example, when they entered the human species, which they did via an intermediate, they never learned how to go human to human. Even to this day, they don't know how to go human to human. So you can't equate Ebola with a coronavirus. Now, why do, you, why do you think you were excluded from those calls? I, I, because it was, I was told to me that uh, they wanted a single narrative and that I obviously had a different point of view. Okay. And, oh, so he actually has some visual memory on that as we go back and look again. Now, why do, you, why do you think you were excluded from those calls? I, I, because it was, I was told to me that uh, they wanted a single narrative and that I obviously had a different point of view. And he's actually not collapsing his fingers together, so it's not a tight gait. He's just relaxed. It's because he had a different point of view. That is literally the reason. And his body is very open to that, even though his arms are together. They're not tight, holding on into a uh, locked gate. Okay. In uh, emails following the conference call, four of the 11 scientists told Fauci that they all found the genetic sequence inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory, basically what you're saying. However, just three days later, these four scientists had drafted a paper arguing the exact opposite, and that's now the infamous proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2. Our investigations show that this paper was prompted by Dr. Fauci, among others, with a goal to disprove the lab leak theory. What is the likelihood that these scientists came across additional information just three days after making these statements to conclude with such certainty that COVID-19 came from nature instead of the lab leak that they thought it was three days earlier? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate. Again, I've said this before, that this whole approach that was taken on January, uh, February 1st and subsequently in the month of February, if you really want to be truthful, it's antithetical to science. Thank you. Science has debate, and they squashed any debate. Thank you. Given what we know now and looking at all the conversations in February of 2020 and before the release of the paper, do you think that uh, Dr. Fauci used this paper to hide the gain-of-function research created, that gain-of-function research created this virus? I can't talk about Fauci's motivation. Do you think that the paper does hide? All right. So this is very interesting in the sense that he can't talk about, that's what he verbally says, but you see him biting on his own lip. His one hand is over with like the wrist part. You can barely, you only see like half the hand, but you see where the fingers are and he's holding on to his own wrist. So he's giving himself pressure points on this whole issue. Yeah, I would say he definitely thinks this. He just won't say it. By the truth. I think it's an inaccurate paper that basically was part of a narrative that they were creating. Remember, this pandemic... And he's got some visual memory on that one as well. And then all of a sudden, he opens up loose, brings up the finger to sit there and say, hey, wait a minute, and then he's going to give you more info. The pandemic did not start in January at the seafood market. We now know there was infections all the way back into September. This was a narrative that was decided that they were going to say this came from the wet market and they were going to do everything they could to support it to negate any discussion about the possibility that this came from a laboratory. I got 20 seconds left. I actually quite like this guy. It is unfortunate of the events that unfolded. I don't know if it was because he didn't have a big enough spine, because we have done him before. He was so excited about this thing. And as I said in that video... I didn't know what the excitement was from. It could be just a new bug to study. You know, some people, it sounds kind of morbid, but it's like, ooh, yeah, it's tragic for you, but there's a new bug to study. Yay! <laughs> Not necessarily nefarious. But from the singing that we're seeing with his body now, we can assume, yes, he was very just excited about a new bug to study. And two, he was the odd man out. As we are listening to him, he has not stated at any moment 
that he had an ally. And I don't mean an ally like, you know, Joe Blow down the street agrees with you. No, I mean somebody with the same credentials as you and the same powers of government as you. He was alone. That's what we're seeing. What you're observing and speaking of, is this something that would be in line with gain-of-function research and the, and the capabilities it would provide to the right. virus? Yeah. I mean, basically, this lab published in 2014 that they accomplished in this, uh, allowing the coronaviruses that they were working with in the lab to bind to the ACE2 receptor in humanized mice. And the only way they did that was by reorienting the binding domain. And it was clear to them at this time. He's nervous on that one. He's really clenching his hands in there. He's got him fisted and holding on to the wrist. And his body is angled in a way so his neck is contorted towards her, but away. Um, that, that was likely the issue in their private conversations. Um, yet by February 4th, a paper on the origins of COVID is drafted by four participants of the February 1 conference call. One of those participants, Dr. Anderson, completely reverses himself in an email to the president of EcoHealth, Peter Dozik, and says the main crock, crackpot theories going around at the moment relate to this virus being somehow engineered, and that is demonstrably false. Um, my question to you, Mr. Redfield, did you know of any evidence that they had found within three days from February 1st to February 4th to be able to confirm that it, it was not created in a lab? Um, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, I was excluded from those conversations, uh, which I found retroactively very disappointed, since I was obviously a virologist and very engaged. And I actually had asked Jeremy Farrar, Tony Fauci, and Tedros to have these conversations. So you see the little bit of glee on his face. He was excluded. And his body sings with him. He was excluded. If I had to guess, based on what we saw with him being so nervous about the whole mouse thing, gain of function just prior to this question from Green, and then we see this. He's like, oh, I'm so happy that you guys did not put me in to your little circle of corruption because it's all coming out, and which is why we see some glee. And then you see the nervousness prior. It's kind of like when you look at a group of people, these are the scientific community. We've already gone over that he was pretty much alienated. He was alone. There is a lot of peer pressure, a lot of peer pressure to go along. I mean, in all honesty, you almost have to be a psychopath to not want to join the crowd. That's just, that's reality. And looking at how he's reacting to some of this stuff, my guess would be, and this is purely my guess, is that he saw some things that they should not have been doing and he kept his mouth shut. And he may regret that today. He did that Fort Diedrich thing, got a whole lot of pushback and he hasn't done it since. The power of peer pressure is real. We can just be thankful that he looks like he has found some allies in the other three that are there. We didn't really go over them at all, which is why we can see him be more open. And that is the one thing that'll bring the corruption to heal is when everyone who disagrees with it realizes they're not alone. If you like it, please share and subscribe. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about analysing body language, there is a video course available on Mandy's website for Gold subscribers.